Okay, I see that we've got quite a few people have joined us. So let me begin then. Uh, I'm welcoming everybody from Oakland, California. I'm Graham Walker. I'm the executive director of the Independent Institute, which of course is uh, based here in Oakland, California, uh, but assembles a cadre of scholars from around the United States and even around the world to address public policy issues with a special angle on preserving uh, liberty and a free society. Um, we are delighted to welcome you to our Lighthouse Briefing Call this morning. Um, <clears throat> we offer this call in the first instance as a benefit to our wonderful donors who support our work. Thank you to those of you who are members of our Lighthouse Society. Uh, I think there's a few people on the call who are considering becoming members of the Lighthouse Society, and um, I'm grateful for their presence as well. Um, as you know, uh, the work of the Independent Institute depends upon and is built upon uh, the contributions of many generous friends and supporters around the country. And uh, if you're inclined to continue your support or begin it, we invite you to do that. And of course, you can always go to our webpage, uh, the top right, um, independent.org, there's a donate button. Uh, and of course, you can always call me personally, uh, as you may wish. So okay, uh, today is the seventh in our briefing series for our Lighthouse Society members on the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we are uh, never pretending uh, in these uh, uh, interviews to be experts on epidemiology, but what we do understand are some of the dynamics of public policy and some of the governmental responses to COVID. And we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the economic consequences of government response today with our speaker, Dr. Christopher Coyne. Uh, welcome, Christopher, we're glad you're with us. Well, thank you, Graham, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna take the liberty of calling you Christopher, I think if you don't mind. Sure. sure. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. But I, I would point out, however, to our participants that uh, uh, Dr. Coyne is uh, certainly um, entitled to some uh, respect for his professional accomplishments. Um, he's the author of multiple books. Um, he also happens to be one of the co-editors of the Independent Review, published here by the Independent Institute, and we're grateful for your uh, contribution there. Uh, and you are a professor at of economics um, at George Mason University. Is that correct? In Northern Virginia. That's right, yeah, Fairfax, okay. Virginia. So right. um, we are gonna be talking about political power and government responses. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, there seem to be kind of two governmental responses that we need to talk about here. The first one is obviously the province of an economist, that is to say uh, the spending that the federal government and others are undertaking in response to the crisis. We'll address that in a moment. Um, but then there's the, another dimension, which is governmental control, new controls that are being exercised. Of course, these are highly controversial. They're contested in many ways. Um, we're not gonna weigh in one way or the other on whether you should go to a protest, but I think when we get to that part of the conversation, uh, Christopher Coyne will talk about some of the implications of governmental control in the medium and long term. But, but starting back at the beginning, uh, Christopher, uh, what about the, the spending? How much spending is going on and, and what's the cost in economic terms of government responses on the financial side? Sure. So, um, you know, there, there's in the wake of the, the COVID pandemic and the spread of it, um, of course, one of the, the policies that were undertaken um, at the federal level, but also by many states to varying degrees was to shut down economic activity or a substantial portion of economic activity. And logically, uh, you don't need a PhD in economics to tell you that if you shut down economic activity, you're gonna get less economic activity and all that comes with it. And of course, right. the reason we like economic activity is it produces goods and services that we like, it produces wealth. Yeah, and I'm so not people, an economist. I'm not an economist, Christopher, but I did notice that. Yeah. <laughs> and so people based on this policy are gonna be poor. And so then the question is, what do you do? And of course, the, the government response at both the federal and then at many state levels was a variety of, of welfare programs. Um, right. And so uh, the, the federal government, of course, passed it in its first iteration, and there'll be various subsequent iterations of, uh, pa uh, of funding packages, but a, a $2.3 trillion package intended to help individuals, to help small businesses, to help large businesses, uh, to help the healthcare industry, and so on. So that was 2.3 trillion. But the overall implication of this is that both spending in the near term and debt are currently increasing dramatically. And so just to provide a little bit of, of context, uh, and I won't bore you with too many details, but 
I, well, I think we, need, these, we need the details. Uh, these, these, these numbers are jarring. And so you look at, at the deficit. And so the, the difference between revenue taken in and spending. And so for this year, the current estimate is that the federal deficit will be about $3.7 trillion. Now to provide some context, in 2019, the deficit was $1 trillion. $1 trillion is a big deficit, by the way. 3.7 is magnitudes bigger. And so you, you get a sense. Another indication, the current national debt is about $25 trillion, um, which is uh, over 100% of, of GDP, the US GDP, somewhere around 20 to $22 trillion mm. a year, depending. Um, to, again, to put that in perspective, prior to the uh, uh, COVID response, the debt to GDP ratio is about 80% uh, of GDP. And that, that's double, by the way, what it was in the Great Recession. And so what you've had since the, the Great Recession back in, in 2007, 2008, was a, a massive spike in debt uh, taken on by the federal government, as well as spending taken on. And one of the things we can talk about more, but I think one of the big issues here is that when things got good, so you had the recession, the great recession, yeah. you have the downturn, and you say, okay, logically, the government should help people out. If they're gonna spend money, that would be a good time to spend it. And you say, okay, fine, you know, again, you can debate that, but let's just say for the sake of discussion, we go with that and say, when, when you get the upturn though, then <clears throat> what, what should you do? Well, you should be frugal. You should retire some of the debt. Well, you save for a rainy day, right? <clears throat> In principle, but what has happened instead? Well, what's happened instead is you, you just had continuous spending, uh, continuous accumulation of debt. And now that we're in the next kind of crisis situation, we're seeing uh, massive spikes to a even greater extent. And so that's why it's troubling because it's unclear how you get out of this given the current trajectory in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's worse. I mean, in a way, the, the, the government's response to the previous recession crisis triggered by the housing uh, mortgage bubble and so forth back in 2008, um, put us in a more vulnerable position and less uh, capability to respond to this totally different kind of crisis, right? That's exactly right. Uh, you know, the, the Fed um, and, and the various government programs, I mean, they, they pulled out all the stops. Uh, the, the problem is, is, is once they injected the steroids into the market right. uh, to really ramp it up, uh, people, uh, and especially, and we can talk more about this because it's a theme that runs throughout a lot of this discussion, I think, is the incentives that politicians face. And so, of course, if you're a politician, whether it's during a downturn or an upturn, you don't want to be the one to withdraw the, the steroids that are, that are pumping up the economy. Right. And so, and so you, you just allow it to keep happening. This is why there's not a tendency to save for a rainy day, as you put it so well. Uh, and so that's one of the fundamental issues we face in democratic politics. Yeah, democratic politics are part of the virtue of American life, but they also are a vulnerability because in a situation of crisis, as you are essentially saying, politicians have an inescapable incentive to continue providing at an unsustainable level the things that people feel that they want and they get rewarded by votes and power. But unfortunately, it has a, then a downside, an undertow, I think you're saying. That's certainly right. That's certainly right. And there's no, there's no easy way out of it because once you cater to target groups, special interest groups, and you give them the goodies, right. then they don't want to give the goodies up. No politician wants to be the politician to give the goodies up. In fact, there, there's a competition between politicians to secure the support of those various groups. And, and the kind of way you do it is by outbidding your uh, opponent. Um, and yeah, so it, right. there, there's a kind of reinforcement effect, which is uh, quite troubling. Uh, another thing where politicians seem to kind of be outbidding one another, uh, kind of turning to the other side of the coin that I, ha, huh, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good side. name for an economist, right? <laughs> I, I, was, I was destined. The coin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you should use that. Um, <laughs> so turning to the other side of the question, uh, we're talking about spending, but the other thing politicians outbid one another on is it seems like there's been an incentive in last uh, eight weeks or so for politicians to sort of outbid one another to see who can be more draconian in imposing controls and restrictions, of course, for a good cause for, for the sake of the public good. Uh, and I'm hardly in a position to be able to say exactly how much restriction on activity is necessary to control uh, the epidemic. But what I think you can comment on are some of the implications of these control measures. So Tell us a little bit about some of the control measures, and then let's talk about their implications. Certainly. And so first, let me say to link this back to what you and I were just discussing, uh, 
you actually can't separate government spending from control. Because, of, of course, when, when someone in Washington, D.C., or whatever state government we're talking about, says we're going to spend X amount of money, again, let's assume it's for a benevolent cause, as you were saying, right. for, the, mm -hmm. for the public good. Someone has to make decisions about how that's allocated, how it's accounted for, what outputs are going to be judged as successes or not. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, there's no profit loss like in a market to judge success or failure. Who's going to do that? Well, of course, politicians are going to do that. Bureaucrats are going to do that. Um, and, then, and then those kind of in the political hierarchy which necessitates political control over life, mm -hmm. over the spending of those resources. And so the minute you expand government control in terms of spending to help people, you are granting dramatic increases in political power to a small group of people right. over spending, the lives of hundreds spending of millions. Spending leads necessarily to control. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so what do you get? Well, again, you think about it and you say, well, what happens? You shut down the, the economy, right, or significant portions of it in the name of the public interest. Well, that policy, and, and again, as we mentioned earlier, this isn't you know, a deep insight. It is a recipe for poverty. Right. Uh, uh, again, you know, why are countries poor? Why are societies poor? Even even and others wealthy because wealthy societies are entrepreneurs right. uh, to 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 innovate, to exchange with other people, to more um, economic have, activity and the rule of law to protect contracts. <laughs> exactly. Now, what happens when government comes in, a bureaucrat, and says you? are engaged in a non-essential activity as determined by me, not, a t not as determined by your fellow citizens. Of course, in markets, you and I and other consumers determine what is essential or not right. by making the decision to either turn over our hard-earned dollars or not to do so. That feedback mechanism is removed in the context of a crisis and government comes in and says, I am saying that what you do <laughs> is non-essential. So it's even more complicated than that. And this is where things get murky because people tend to look at final goods and services. So they'll go into a store and say, well, of course, you know, if you go into Walmart where I am, for instance, there's kind of caution tape around the clothing section, right. the toy section, the landscaping section, because those are the non-essential areas, according to some bureaucrat. And on the face of it, you see why they say, well, we want to minimize exposure in the store interaction between people. And you say, OK, but wait a second. These goods that are populating this, these various aisles didn't fall from on high. People had to make them. Mm -hmm. Typically, thousands <laughs> of people go into producing even the most basic item that you and I take for granted. I remember seeing this wonderful video where this inventor took apart a basic toaster and tried to put it together from scratch. And, it, and he took it apart. And this is a toaster you and I would throw out if it broke. It was like $5. So the most basic toaster you can find. And it's something like 480 parts from all around the world. Uh, and, and this all comes together into this toaster that you and I purchase for next to nothing. We use it. And when it doesn't work, we just throw it out and buy a new one. Yeah. So, you know, here's what like the man on the street might say. Wow, that's a complicated toaster. <clears throat> we better make sure that we have like a toaster bureaucracy to coordinate all the different inputs to that toaster because otherwise we won't have a toaster. We need a really omniscient bureaucracy to produce that toaster. Don't we, Christopher Coyne? Right, yeah, you need the toasters there. And, and, and so, so what happens? You say toasters aren't, they're non-essential, let's say. What have you done? You have harmed the entire chain of production that went into producing that toaster. You have literally destroyed the supply chain of all those different <laughs> products that feed into that, that then uh, produce goods and services. Now take that logic and apply it across all of the goods and services deemed non-essential. You right. can see why this is troubling. Then government comes in and says, well, now we need more spending in order to help people that are suffering. Mm -hmm. And so how, what are we going to do? We're going to spend more. We're going to issue more debt. And then we're going to control how that money is spent, how it's allocated, who gets it, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, this leads to a whole host of unintended consequences. And so one of the issues I'm sure many people have read about is, is unemployment benefits, right? You say, okay, well, we need to help people that are unemployed. And you say, maybe, maybe not. Again, you can debate that, but let's assume we're going with it. Right. Well, well, what's happened? You have federal unemployment, then you have state unemployment. And in many states, you can earn more by being unemployed as compared to looking for work. And so I've read numerous stories where you have, for instance, a coffee shop owner a small local mom and pop coffee shop owner who's trying to stay open amidst the, the COVID pandemic. And so they can't have customers in, so they're offering curbside delivery or even home delivery in some cases. But a lot of these places are struggling because they can't find employees because they say employees earn more staying home and collecting unemployment as compared to you coming to work for me, what I can pay for them in order to cover my costs in order to remain in business. And you have to ask yourself, well, 
in that case, are we really, is, is the government really serving the public interest in terms of improving human well-being and, and inc increasing economic mm -hmm. well-being? Uh, I, I would say certainly not. And so then you can see, again, if you take this logic and apply it across all these different instances of, of goods and services which are deemed non-essential, how it's highly problematic <laughs> for the economic well-being of, of American society broadly understood. Right. Now, one of the things you've said to me before um, was that these policies um, you noted to me have led to distortions or observable distortions, as you put it, to labor and capital markets. I think that's a fancy way of talking about what you've just been saying. Is that right? That's right. That's, that's the fancy way of saying uh, you know, labor markets are, are laborers, people that could be working. Uh, capital, the way economists talk about capital is capital is any intermediary good that goes into a final producer good. So in my toaster example, all the little parts that go into producing that final toaster are, are capital goods. And so these policies distort that chain of, 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 of combinations of goods that produce things we want, and that includes the allocation of labor. The other thing that happens that we're observing, um, and, and you, you'll know this very well based in California, is, it, is that the effects of pre-existing regulations are being amplified dramatically. And mm -hmm. one of those is in California. And of course, uh, uh, the Independent Institute has lot, done a lot of great work trying to get this suspended, which is California Assembly Bill 5, which did what? Well, it tried to say, look, you have these contractors, many in the gig economy, and you had all, like, labor unions and other activists saying it's unfair that they are being treated as contractors and not employees. They should have access to minimum wage, access right. to unemployment mm -hmm. insurance, sick leave, and so on. So we are going to force uh, employers to default to treating them as employees unless they can somehow provide justification that they should be contractors. And you say, that's great for the workers. Mm -hmm. Well, now think about what's happened. What's happened is that now, you know, Los Angeles Times had a wonderful article that, that led with this example that I'm about to give a couple weeks ago. And they said, there's this worker, I forget her name. She had put together all these different like jobs that, that she was an opera singer and a, a, a singing teacher. And she had piecemealed all these jobs that would make a living. Mm -hmm. And of course, with COVID, now she has to stay home. She's under a stay at home order. Right. And so what did she do? She went online and tried to get jobs. What kind of jobs? Well, one was transcribing videos and it's an hourly wage. She applied and she got denied. Why did she get denied? Because they, they'd say, well, you have to be an employee and the cost of hiring you are too high. So what has this regulation <laughs> done? It has distorted labor markets in two uh -huh. ways. In two ways. One, this person could have gotten a job that would have made themselves better off. They would have earned income. They would have been able to afford groceries, their rent, their bills, and so on. Yeah, and she could have combined that with a couple other gigs. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and on top of that, she is prevented from helping her fellow citizens. She is prevented from providing goods and services to other people. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of cases, you see these regulations that are preventing people from helping other people who are suffering. And so if you think about it, should a young person who has a relatively low risk of suffering great harm from COVID be prevented from going out to shop for or help or assist older people who are higher, at higher risk for contracting COVID and, and it killing them, for instance? Mm -hmm. I would submit no. They can, people can serve a valuable service by offering their labor, in this case, to help people that can't leave the house. But in many cases, they're prevented from doing so or restricted from doing so. And you have this network of regulations and government control, which is highly distorting the ability of people to come up with innovative ways to help their, themselves and their fellow citizens. And that's a recipe for, for disaster, both in the immediate term, but also in the long term as well. You make, um, you make economics sound like a humane science. Like it's, this is the way that people, we need to make sure people are cared for, <clears throat> not by the state, but by themselves and one another. That's certainly right. You know, there's, there's, there's a, a, a mistake that a dichotomy that's often made, which I think is a huge mistake, which is people talk about economic costs or profit and then human costs. You know, who people say we cannot have people right. get sick or die for profit, but little do they realize that these things are all entangled, that economic all costs entangled. are human costs, exactly. right? We, what do we like? We like health. We like food, shelter, the well-being of our family, but we also like helping our fellow citizens. We're, we're humane people, as you put it. And so these things are all intertwined. And you, if you cut off some of them, you cut off others by definition. Exactly. And, you know, we said this before in some of these um, conversations that we've had with our friends around the country, but uh, it seems clear that economic shutdown <clears throat> endangers public health. Even though economic shutdown is undertaken in the name and for the sake of public health, there's you can't, it's not a simple trade-off money versus lives. It's, 
it's lives versus lives, but in a complex long-term uh, relationship uh, that we can't pretend to untangle entirely. We can do our best in the short run, but the thing I think people need to hear from, from you uh, and from us and our, our other work that we do is that uh, whatever may or may not be necessary in a very short run, we've got to make sure that the public is educated and doesn't allow these things to persist longer than the immediate crisis, because otherwise they're going to take a light on a life of their own, the controls will, and the spending, of course, will create an undertow in permanently in the wrong direction. We can't allow these, this crisis to produce these results. Even though other crises in the past have produced these bad results, it's not an essential historical necessity that they produce the bad results. Now, we can resist the downside of this crisis. Sure, and, and again, this is one of the basic insights of economics. Uh, Frederick Bastiat, of course, is one of the things he's famous for is pointing out the seen and the unseen. So there's observable, mm -hmm. And then there's the unobservable. And the art of economics, is, as Henry Hazlitt, the New York Times journalist, put it, the art of economics is focusing on the unseen and these consequences. And so, you know, you say, okay, we're going to save a life, so therefore we're going to shut down businesses. But then what are you going to do when a small business owner goes bankrupt and they can't afford health care? And then you say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have government-imposed health care. And then that leads to distortions. And you say, well, now we need to have further interventions in order to adjust for that. And one of the important things, and it's very hard for people to see, and one of the, the hardest things to defend about freedom in the broadest sense right. is that freedom does not promise you concrete ends. It promises you freedom to do different things. Because, and one of the reasons we like freedom is because it allows us to pursue things that we can't anticipate, whether that is in our personal life, in terms of innovations, and so on. Politicians can almost always promise you seen, observable goodies. If you just give me a little more money, a little more power, a little more control, give up some of your liberty, I can give you X. I can give you more health care. I can give you more right. schooling. And that's a hard, it's a a hard thing to it's combat. It's tangible, whereas what liberty has to say for itself is where practiced under the rule of law, it has a track record of tending to foster the generation more of the things that you really want than having the state do it in the curtailment of liberty. But that's a long-term perspective that doesn't feel quite the same as if I vote for this guy, I'm gonna get a bigger check next week. Certainly, and if you, if you look at most great innovations throughout history, not all of them, but most of them, they were a, a long process of experimentation. Often they involved ex, uh, mistakes. Right. So right. people are trying to do one thing and then they made a mistake and they said, aha, something else happened. Right. There was lots of failure involved and that's what leads to wealth creation and improvements in human well-being. We've got a bunch of friends on the line. I see some friends of mine on my, my list here of participants from friends from Oklahoma on the line and from Massachusetts and from Utah and elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> if you are on this call, uh, I would love to have you ask a question directly to Dr. Christopher Coyne. Um, and if you want to do that, a couple ways to do it. The best way is just to go into the um, participant panel and raise your hand and I'll see that and then I'll open your mic and you can talk. The reason I've got your mics closed is because if everybody's mic were open, it would be a cacophony of sound. So your mic is muted, but I can unmute you if you raise your hand in the participant panel. Also, you can click type an email to questions at independent.org and I'll get that right away. And then if you know how to use the chat box on Zoom, you can type it in there too. So three ways. <clears throat> I'm, I'm watching, okay, friends, I know, I know who you are and I know you have questions. So raise your hand in that participant panel. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, let me just make a comment while I'm waiting for a couple of these uh, people to raise their hands, uh, Christopher. We, we have talked about uh, how these crises occur. And of course, the Independent Institute uh, published years ago this by your colleague, our colleague, Robert Higgs, this book called Crisis in Leviathan, which is really kind of a classic analysis of this process by which crises end up becoming opportunities by which state power is increased, but not always rolled back. In fact, there's a kind of a perverse incentive for the ratchet to roll it forward. I would say, again, it's not some kind of an ineluctable historical inevitability, but there's a tendency for humans to react that way. So our friends who are on the line, by all means, take a look at this classic book. Uh, it's much in the news, actually, these days. Uh, uh, Bob Higgs' book is being discussed, and it's part of the phenomenon that uh, uh, Christopher Coyne is talking about. Okay, so I have someone raising her hand, and I am going to allow... Uh, Sally to talk. Sally, I think I've just unmuted you. Uh, and if, yeah. Can you hear me? There, okay, yes, yeah. let's hear from Sally. I think you're in Massachusetts. Sally. Yes, I am. My question is, 
as an economist, how, um, I can't think of how to frame it, how bewildering is this world we're living in now? And how predictable is it? I mean, are there things that you're seeing from your, your theories and your background that, that are playing out the way you would expect? And then how large is the realm of the unknown and where is it exactly? Thank you. Zach. That's, a, that's a wonderful set of questions and an important set of questions. And so let me just say a few things because th those are all big issues, but I, I can say a few general comments, which is certainly I, I, I think uh, uh, the world right now is no more bewildering than it is at any other point in time. And I know that that might sound counterintuitive, but the world is always a complicated place. What, what, is, what is happening now is that we're seeing up close and out in the open many of the issues that we oftentimes take for granted. So on a daily basis, when we walk into a store, we take for granted how all this stuff gets there. We don't pay attention to government regulations. Many people don't take, uh, pay attention to government spending or government programs, except if, if somehow they're directly involved in them. And now it's bringing to the forefront all those things. And so the same fundamental issues exist. We have scarcity, we have scarce resources we need to deal with, and we need to figure out how to deal it deal with it. And really, there's two choices in the broadest sense. We can let individual people decide how to deal with scarcity, how they allocate their time, their mm -hmm. effort, their resources, or we can turn that power over to politicians. That exists during crisis and not crisis. Right. The, the issue is that during crisis, and this is links, uh, Graham, to your point about Bob Higgs book, Christ and Leviathan, is that people are often scared and they are willing or more willing to turn over power to government that they otherwise would be unwilling to in other times. And that can have long lasting effects. So what does that mean though, in terms of, of, of predictability, in terms of where we go from here? here here's what, what I would suggest. You know, Bob Higgs, in addition to that book, raised another a, a very important issue when talking about World War II and the Great Depression. And that's in the wake of the Great Depression in, in America. And that's this idea of what he calls regime uncertainty. And regime uncertainty is when the government has all these fluctuating policies. And they announce one thing, but they do another thing. They say, we might spend a lot of money. We might not spend a lot of money. We might regulate what you can do with this. or we might not. And, and there's a lack of predictability. Graham, what you were talking about earlier with the rule of law. We don't know what the rule of law looks like. Can government just confiscate things or move things around when they want to? Why is that problematic? It's problematic because if you are an entrepreneur, whether you are running the, the biggest of corporations or a small startup, regime uncertainty makes it extremely difficult for you to plan. It makes it extremely difficult for you to invest your hard-earned resources or to convince other people through capital markets to give you resources to invest in order to operate your business or expand your business. And that is at the heart of, of economic wealth creation. And so what economics tells us in terms of dealing with this is that to the greatest extent possible, we need to allow people to engage in voluntary economic activity. And mm -hmm. you say, well, how do we actually implement that? How do we operationalize that? Well, one thing we can do right away is look to remove as many regulations as we can that preclude people right. from doing that. If you look at most regulations, most regulations are justified in terms of the public good. We need to license heart surgeons because we don't want anyone operating on someone's heart. Now, you can debate whether you need that or not. But let's say, okay, there, there's that role for regulation. Most regulations don't do that. What most regulations do is they prevent people from doing things. They say, if you are a medical worker in society, in, in state X, you cannot operate in state Y. Right. If you are a hairdresser uh, operating here, you cannot operate there. Why? Because special interest groups have lobbied government to pass regulations in order to uh, limit competition. Uh, well, they're trying to limit damage to follicles. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the great threat. That's the great crisis, the great, the great risk. And so removing as many of those regulations as possible is a wonderful way to empower individuals to engage in value-added services and, 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 and producing things and helping their fellow citizens uh, to improve their, their well-being. Uh, and, and to my way of thinking, that is, that's what we need. We need a diversity of different innovations, not just in, in technological products, but also in the way we interact with people. You know, none of what I'm saying denies the, the severity uh, of, of the COVID pandemic, by the not way. Not at all, no. Uh, it is, how are we going to deal with it? Do you want a top-down solution? You may not interact with people unless you are in these circumstances or not at all. Or do you want the choice to say, I want to interact with these people, but I'll only do it if they do X. 
Maybe you'll only go to stores that require people to wear masks, or you'll only go to movie theaters if there's three seats between people. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer people, to that. People type of will question. decide what, what they think is wise. Yeah, or they can stay home. I mean, the problem is different people have different risk profiles, right? And they have different conditions. And, and so in, in terms of their health. And so that's what we need to, to balance and deal with. I'm going to um, switch now to another question. Um, uh, I know we're kind of near the end, but we have some interesting questions pending here. Um, John has this question in the chat box, which I'm going to read, although probably you can see it. John says, is there a method for projecting the range of unseen costs over time? For example, excess debt slows growth by X percent and an X percent reduction in growth over time results in Y degree poorer health outcomes. Can we reduce these things to, I guess, a kind of projection that will be persuasive so we can avoid these outcomes? Sure. And, and so lots of people try to do these things. Uh, and economists have been doing this for a long time. They have lots of models that try to forecast yeah, you take stabs trade offs. Yeah. And, 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 and to be honest with you, uh, you know, both during normal times and crisis times, these, these models are not very good and they're not very reliable. And one way you know this is that, uh, and you, you, you all are familiar with this, you know, you see these different studies that people make about, if for anyone that lives in an area where they've talked about sports stadiums and should government subsidize sports stadiums, the people that want the sports stadium, they get economists to say, this sports stadium is gonna generate this amount of economic growth. And mm -hmm. then the people that don't want it, they say it's gonna uh, lead to economic contraction or cost more than it's worth. The, the, the reality is, is that the, given the complexities of the world and our inability to understand those complexities, even the most well-trained, intelligent economist can't do this. And, and so what they end up doing is estimating, guessing, making assumptions, excluding very important things. And of course, there's always the, 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 the most important factor, which is the unknown, which is we don't know what the next big innovation is, which going back to our earlier discussion, is why we like, one of the reasons we like freedom. Well, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is it allows people to discover that next big innovation that no one would have thought of. Right. And, and so you can't account for that. And many of the models uh, neglect this. They act as if the world is static and fixed. And then they say, given if we held everything constant, like the world was in a box or a vacuum, here's what would happen. But it never oper operates that way. People innovate to come up with new ways of doing things, which is why I want to empower people to have the freedom to come up with better things because to my way of thinking and my way of understanding the world and the process of wealth creation, that is what is going to improve human well-being, both in the immediate term, but also in the long run. So in one way of answering John's question in my sort of simple terms would be um, economists can take stabs at those kind of projections, um, but there's not enough omniscience to really be certain about it. But one thing we can see historically, um, is that liberty under the rule of law has a track record that demonstrates its efficacy um, far better, uh, being far better than government and bureaucratically mandated uh, situations. Moreover, I would simply add uh, that uh, when citizens are largely free to figure out what they're going to do, what they're going to buy, what they're going to consume, whom they're going to relate to, and so forth, uh, and it's not dictated you know, by your bureaucrats in the state, it tends to have a kind of a vivifying effect on human personality. People recover their own sense of agency, um, which is a very strong moral good that emerges better under the system of freedom. If people are accustomed to being powerless and everything depends upon the government, they're gonna, their sense of their own agency will shrink unnecessarily, and that's a profound moral, moral loss. So um, I'm going right. to go to another question. Um, there's a friend in Oklahoma who I think is on the line, and you are free to talk. Uh, I think I've got you, and let me try again. Okay, you are unmuted. Thank you very much. It seems in a time like this that we're having, uh, data and information seems to be very important, but the data being provided by the government uh, is poorly defined. Uh, we're really not sure of the number of coronavirus cases, uh, we're not uh, sure of the cause of death of many of the coronavirus patients. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're skewed because there are some incentives in the healthcare industry uh, to report this as a viral death as opposed to COPD or something yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, from an economic standpoint, that holds true for any information we need in order to understand how the Leviathan works. Uh, can you comment some on how this information is controlled and and how 
how it would ever be possible to get good information uh, in order to respond to what seems like just to be an effort to frighten people and change their behavior. Certainly, and so thank you for that question. It's an extremely important question, not just for, for this particular crisis, but, but a broader set of issues as, as, as you touched upon at the end of your question, so thank you for that. The issue of data is an extremely difficult one, and it's difficult for a variety of reasons. Number, one is just the, the, as I was discussing a moment ago, the ability to collect data on a complex system and, and piece it together in a set of causal relationships to make predictions and, and understand the world's it, it, hard to do. But then you take into account, as you rightly pointed out, the incentives of the various parties collecting that and presenting that information, and you, it gets even more complicated. And so, uh, and, and then it gets even more complicated in a situation where now, because it's a global pandemic, so you have multiple governments involved. And so you have the Chinese government, you have the Russian government, and these governments are, are notoriously terrible uh, at collecting and presenting data. Uh, uh, or, or presenting data in a manner that uh, is severely biased uh, to benefit their interests. But of course, the American government does the same thing. And so wh where does that leave us? Well, I'll say this. I, I think the best we can do is, is to have a, a, a inherent skepticism of, of data that is presented by government, but more specifically have a skepticism of very clear-cut or what seems to be clear-cut policies that are predicated on that data. And so you oftentimes people say, this is the science and we must do X. Well, step back for a moment. That, that tries to make it sound like there's this objective information that everyone knows and everyone agrees with. But as the current pandemic is making clear, there's not objective data. It is collected by human beings. Certain things, as you pointed out, are excluded. Um, some of that just because of resources. In the case of COVID, the, the uh, lack of testing. Uh, some of it by choice, as you correctly pointed out, how deaths are, are classified. So again, this issue of comorbidity is, is a huge issue. Um, uh, that is, what is the real underlying cause of, of death for people that pass away? And how do you classify that? But that goes for, for, for all things government does. When they re release data, it's oftentimes severely manipulated. Uh, uh, and so we just need to be skeptical. Now look, there, there are people in the world that, that don't face these risks, and that's oftentimes people in business. They too rely on data. They aggregate data up for their business, and they act on it. And you say, well, what's the difference? Are, are, are they more noble? The well, perhaps. scale, for one thing. Yeah, sure. I, well, that, the scale, right? Really what it is is the profit loss mechanism, which is that, uh, 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 you know, w w you, when you face profit loss, you face hard constraints, you face hard feedback, mm -hmm. and you have an incentive to collect data that is useful that is actually capturing consumer preferences because consumers are the ultimate captain of the economic ship. But as Graham and I discussed earlier, when we move into the realm of democratic politics, that's not the case anymore. And so politicians will tend to collect and distribute data that is preferable to them and looks good to their friends uh, and, and attempt to harm their enemies. And that's, that's just the way democratic politics works. And so skepticism is, is the best we've got. Um, and anytime data is prese presented, whether it is a politician that you are favorable towards or unfavorable towards, trying your best to keep that in mind, I think, is, a, is an important thing to do. We've got to wrap it up, unfortunately, to keep our promises on time, or at least roughly keep them. But um, let me just highlight a couple of things I think are extremely important in what uh, uh, Christopher Coyne has said. <clears throat> it seems clear that uh, there are ways in which the restrictions on government power um, they, they have a, an undertow and there's a risk of, of, of the extension of them. There's a risk of the debt being um, overgrowing uh, our economic resources. But at the same time, um, I don't believe that uh, we are doomed. I, I think, in fact, what happens is that people discover that sometimes uh, the evidence is, is uh, runs the other direction. And when people are persuaded, then you see the virtue of democratic or participatory politics. People can, in fact, weigh in. You mentioned skepticism, which I think you're recommending as a virtue, Christopher. Yeah, oh, certainly. Yeah. And so, so I, I think that is the part of being a good citizen is being skeptical and questioning. Being skeptical, being skeptical does not require being cynical. No, no, not or, at all. And it especially doesn't require being fatalistic. In fact, um, if you were fatalistic, you wouldn't even bother being skeptical. That's exactly but, right. Yeah. But being skeptical is worth it. And so, you know, essentially what, what we are trying to assemble here at the Independent Institute is, is a set of resources, including work by Christopher Coyne and many of his colleagues that can uh, help the educated public to understand what's going on and to, to lean in the other direction, take advantage of what is possible by way of shifting 
uh, attitudes on these things. So for example, you mentioned AB5 in California. You know, people in California actually are waking up to realize that this restriction on the freedom to do independent contracting work turned out to be kind of a bum deal and made us more vulnerable to the epidemic. And then there's the whole business about medical practice restrictions. Even here in California, of all places, even our own governor, who was the mayor of San Francisco, of all places, recognized not long ago, one of the few things he's recognized clearly, is that uh, lifting restrictions appropriately on medical practice actually serves the common good rather than trying to constrict. And so uh, he's done some of that. Uh, and people are discovering that the reason we didn't have tests is because the CDC was holding it so tightly in their hand that private companies weren't to be able to develop the tests. So many ways this crisis, while it portends a great threat to increase uh, debt and control, it also shows us reasons for glimmers of hope when these uh, kind of factors become more evident. Uh, the pattern of freedom under the rule of law will produce better results, not just in general, but even for the public health. And so uh, thank you to Dr. Christopher Coyne for all of your insights. Thank you, Graham. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you all for, for attending and for your wonderful questions. Yeah, there's just a lot more that could be said. Um, and again, thanks everybody on the call. Uh, you stand with us as supporters, most of you, and you make all this possible. We're grateful for that. Um, invite you again to consider looking at the Independent Review, which Christopher Coyne is a co-editor of a very important uh, quarterly that addresses public policy issues in a way that ordinary people can't understand, and we appreciate that. Um, you can go to our donate page at www.independent.org. Also, we have a COVID information page at independent.org. I encourage you to go there. Educate yourself, educate your friends, point them in our direction. Um, I think if we all lean uh, against these, uh, th these bad results of government response, that we, we may not be doomed. We might actually see some light at the end of these tunnels. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christopher Coyne. And thank you from the Independent Institute. Take care.